This is the story of a horror fantasy, which is becoming increasingly real. The great white shark is not a myth. It is a magnificent, beautiful reality. It's the most dangerous and feared fish in the ocean. Now, it's the star of one of the most successful Hollywood movies of all time. On the American 4th of July holiday weekend in 1982, the fantasy turned into reality. That scene from Jaws was reenacted, but this time it was for real. A popular beach just outside San Francisco was closed. Lifeguards on duty had spotted the fin of a great white shark patrolling the shoreline. This time, everyone managed to leave the water and no one was hurt but the occasion added to the growing list of frightening incidents around the coast. Sharks are not new in San Francisco. The early Spanish explorers named part of the Bay Area Shark Point. For some years, sightings lessened, but today, attacks on humans by great white sharks have reached a new and alarming level. In the California Academy of Sciences is the Steinhardt Aquarium, which houses one of the finest displays of fish in the world. It's not just a popular tourist attraction, the aquarium is a major marine research center. One man who has been studying the great white shark for more than a decade, and who has spent many hours underwater in various parts of the world, trying to discover the truth behind the legend, is the director of the aquarium, Dr. John McCosker. Since the film Jaws, there has been a worldwide fascination with the great white shark, and with good reason. It is the single most ferocious fish on our planet. I've spent the last 10 years of my life studying the great white shark, both above and below water. And for each answer I obtain, I raise two new questions. At the Steinhardt Aquarium, we built this giant ocean tank with the great white shark in mind. 
Well, the story I'm about to tell you ends with a collision of the great white shark and man, but it begins with an altogether different creature. Seals and sea lions, they appear to be the masters of their environment. Perhaps no one knows more about them than Dr. Bernie LeBeau, a scientist at the University of California at Santa Cruz. He has followed their plight, their manners, and their mores for nearly two decades. Presently, you find thousands of uh, marine mammals uh, near Año Nuevo and other parts of California today. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, there would have been very few of them uh, in many of these places. And the reason for this is that uh, these animals were exploited by sealers in the last century. In the early 1800s, many of the populations were, were made virtually extinct. Uh, the elephant seal, for example, uh, during the nadir of its, its history in 1880s, may have been reduced to as few as uh, 50 animals, perhaps less than that. Today, we have over 75,000. So uh, some of these animals have made a remarkable comeback from their extinction. I think the future for seals and sea lions along the coast of California is very bright. Uh, first of all, the major predator, human beings, have been taken out of the picture. The Marine Mammal Act of 1972 prohibits people from harassing, injuring, or in any way, uh, uh, affecting these animals. Secondly, food constraint, which is normally what you look for in terrestrial mammals, uh, doesn't seem to be very important with these marine mammals. So that leaves the, the final part of this equation, the major predator, the white shark. I think the, the white shark certainly will also have a bright future because it will have uh, more food uh, to eat. Uh, so uh, the future looks very good for the white shark. Massive wounds and half-moon-shaped bite scars are telling evidence of attacks by white sharks. Recent legislation has protected seals from the guns and clubs of men who hunted them for their fur. But our laws cannot alter their place in the food chain. I suggest that within the last century, we have experienced a very abnormal situation in California waters. Let me show you why. You see, at one time, marine mammals abounded along our coast. Elephant seals, seals, sea lions, and sea otters were plentiful. But with the 19th and early 20th century hunters, their numbers were brought so low that several species were nearly brought to extinction. Recently, however, efforts to conserve these animals have brought their numbers back, and their numbers continue to climb. Along with the reduction of marine mammals, was the reduction of their major predator, the great white shark. You see, the great white shark was nearly starved into local extinction without food to prey upon. And with conservation, their numbers have also climbed. Now add mankind to the equation. In the middle of this century, man went into the water in hordes. Scuba divers, surfers, skin divers, all entered California waters, and as their line has grown, it has crossed the white shark line, and when that has happened, it means trouble for us. Little did we realize a decade ago, when we passed laws to preserve marine mammals, that we would also increase the number of great white sharks that also prey upon us. Alcatraz Island, a maximum security prison in San Francisco Bay, 
was thought to be inescapable because of the sharks in the surrounding waters. In 1982, attacks in Northern California reached an alarming level. Lifeguards called a meeting on the bay, and I was invited to address them. It's not the number of attacks that's so interesting, it's the frequency of attacks, whereby in history we would see an attack every few years. In the 50s, we would see an attack every couple of years. It looked like it was happening more often, obviously. It was because there were more people going into the water. Then something very strange happened about the time the film Jaws came out. There were, if you recall, uh, seven attacks in Northern California that summer. I think it had nothing to do with the film Jaws. I think it had a lot to do with the things that Jaws eats. Then the Rare and Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973, and so all marine mammals were then protected and are protected and should be protected. And that's when we started to see the incredible increase in the number of attacks. That was not a massive infusion of surfers and abalone divers. People had been in the water by that time in great numbers. John, can you describe the actual process by which the shark bites and kills its prey? The prey is at the surface basking hyperventilating, whether it's an abalone diver or an elephant seal waiting to make its next dive. The shark is beneath it, looks up, sees the silhouette, probably 20, 30, 40 feet away. Makes an upward rush towards it. Shark rolls its eyes backwards, lifts its snout. It can't see at this point. Its upper jaw teeth are coming out of its mouth. Takes a huge bite mid-body. Lifts its prey out of the water. If it's a diver, 180 pounds is nothing. It just lifts them clear out of the water holds them there momentarily, drops them down, and then slowly swims away from it, surrounding it. Swims far enough away so that it can't be gouged and bitten by the prey and waits for the prey to bleed to death. Uh, I don't think you can prepare for the remote possibility of a white shark attack on a California beach. I think the only thing you can do is try and prevent people from going into the water in an area where there is a high probability of white shark attack. At that meeting, we reviewed the closure of Stinson Beach on the 4th of July weekend, the lifeguard on duty at the time. We'd had warnings for the previous month, really, of the possibility of sharks, some fairly good confirmed sightings of sharks the previous two or three days. The last day, or actually July 2nd, we had a very reliable local fisherman who was fishing offshore off the central portion of Stinson Beach. Uh, definitely sighted an 18, approximately 18-foot 18 great white shark eating on a, on a dead seal. That prompted the closure of the beach at that time. We cruised the beach with our four-wheel drive beach vehicle using the loudspeaker. And once the message got through over the sound of the surf, people complied rather quickly. Sharks have always been here. If you're in the water along the coast of California, you're within approximately one mile of a great white shark. My opinion is that Peter Benchley and his Jaws series had uh, people thinking about sharks in a very, very negative way. Did Peter Benchley, in his wildest dreams, suspect that his first book, Jaws, would be translated into 15 languages and become America's most successful first novel since Gone with the Wind? What was this Jaws phenomenon? And why did the public respond so emotionally to it? Here, in his home in Princeton, New Jersey, Benchley responds to the charge that he created a negative attitude. When the book came out, there was an awful lot of fear around the beaches that summer. And it was coincidental that at that time, we were also making the movie on Martha's Vineyard. And it was a kind of healthy, thrilling fear. The movie changed everything, and the reaction became first of all, worldwide, and second, movies being a, a very hot medium as opposed to television, it, it, it put the fear into people in a, in a tangible way. And there was an immediate reaction, which I was very upset about. Uh, people regarded the killing of a shark as a great macho triumph. And Valerie and Ron Taylor, the great Australian cinematographers and divers, called me and said, you don't understand what's going on down here. People are going out on these slaughter trips to prove some sort of macho nonsense about themselves. And sharks are being killed left and right. And we are worried that there may be actually uh, an endangerment of some of the species. That was unfortunate. Um, 
there were people in the United States who reacted in a perverse way. There was a girl I in the Midwest I read about who had been incarcerated, institutionalized, because in the middle of the Midwest, quite far from an ocean, she fantasized that she was being pursued down the street by a great white shark. This kind of reaction I can neither take responsibility for nor particularly worry about. I can lament it on a, on a small scale. But I'm responsible for what I write, yes. I'm not responsible for how people react to it any more than I think Mario Puzo can be personally upset every time somebody shoots an Italian because of The Godfather. Shark attacks are not new. In this 1778 portrait by the American painter John Singleton Copley, we see Brooke Watson, who's fallen into the water of Havana Harbor. He's about to be attacked by a very large shark. Look at the fear in the eyes of his mates. They're reaching out, trying to save him. He's reaching out, trying to grasp their hands. Look at the futile attempt of the oarsman, trying to fend off that large shark with merely a lance. Incredibly, Watson survived the attack. He lost his leg, but returned to London and eventually became the Lord Mayor. A century later, Winslow Homer created his most famous painting, The Gulf Stream. It depicts the lone survivor on a demasted sailing vessel. His mates are in the water. You can see the blood as the sharks are attacking them and attempting to attack the boat. You can see the onrushing tornado. This picture so horrified the public that Homer later apologized and is reputed to have said, tell them it is all right. The tornado does not hit him and he is picked up by a ship. But is this predator's reputation deserved? No question, the most dangerous animal who has ever plagued man on Earth is Pasturella pestis, the plague louse. He's killed more people than <laughs> any other critter in the history of the human race. However, they see a shark, they meaning the populace in general, and specifically a great white shark for all of the reasons of his size and his solitude and, and his, his general menace, his air of being a devil. A shark is an animal in an environment in which they might well find themselves, either by intent or by accident, falling off a boat, going swimming. He will do the worst thing possible, which is eat you, in the worst way possible, which is alone, helpless, out of reach of, of any assistance, and in a grotesque, terminal way. There is something very nightmarish about a shark. After Jaws came out, a panel of seven psychiatrists was, was brought together by some publication or other to analyze why this phenomenon had occurred. And to abbreviate their findings, it was basically that shark was a nightmare, a, sh a shark was a nightmare creature that performed a nightmare function that was as atavistically primeval as imaginable, that is, consuming a human being, being consumed by another animal. And that it somehow, and believe me, it was accidental as far as I'm concerned, touched a truly primal nerve in an enormous number of people. But to those few, like Australian Rodney Fox, whose primal nerves have been bitten, it's a different story. Rodney narrowly escaped with his life. Today, he makes a living organizing shark expeditions. It was the South Australian Championships, Spearfishing Championships in 1963. I had actually won the South Australian Spearfishing title the year before and was very keen to regain it. And there were 40 divers swimming for four hours. We had speared a lot of fish and I was swimming out to a drop-off to try and capture a large species of dusky moorwong. I it was about 20 feet under the water and uh, snorkelling along with just no scuba tanks or anything with the spear gun in front of me and I had sighted a fish when all of a sudden a great thrash and a crunch in my left hand side. It grabbed me around the chest and I knew instinctively that it had to be a great white and as you can see it had its uh, the big triangular teeth, single teeth here. The doctors had to cut the wound right through here, get right inside and stitch up the, the lung and then the ribs and then the skin over the lot. I raced up to the surface and had one breath of air and got dragged down underwater as the shark grabbed hold of a big nylon boy I was towing and towed me through the water again. Miraculously, the, the cord that I was towing behind me had snapped and I managed to just float up to the surface and uh, a boat was on its way out, saw all the blood in the water and quickly pulled me on board and raced me into hospital where I was repaired fairly quickly. Most people think that more shark attacks occur in Australia than anywhere else in the world. But in fact, that is not so. The majority of great white shark attacks occur within 100 miles of San Francisco. This area is now known as the Red Triangle, and with good reason. 
Between Tomales Bay, Monterey Bay, and the Farallon Islands, more than 30 attacks have occurred in the last 25 years. Along with every shark attack comes the media's overreaction. It's always front page news. And that, of course, feeds the public's paranoia. The remote Farallon Islands, the western point of the triangle, are inhabited by a community of seabirds, seals, and sharks. I've been to the Farallons many times in search of great whites. In 1962, underwater cinematographer Al Giddings and his partner visited the islands. They discovered a white shark by accident. The Roy came up perhaps 100 yards from the boat and uh, was swimming back to the boat. I was at the boat uh, when a great white attacked him. Uh, his first screams were so so high, I couldn't imagine that it was Leroy. In fact, I thought it was a woman and started swimming frantically toward this disturbance in the water in a body. And I guess swam half the distance and stopped to make sure that I was still on the right track. And uh, was astounded when I, when I looked up to see that I was looking in the eyes of Leroy French, who was my business partner at the time. And uh, Leroy, of course, was just about out of his mind and in fact he said that was his worst moment um, looking right into my eyes and screaming Al please don't leave me help God help um, I saw a great tail come up over his head behind him he couldn't see it but he could see reflected in my eyes the the terror and uh, total amazement and could hear the rush of water behind him and of course he'd already been hit once so he knew it was coming again and uh, sort of before my unbelieving eyes the tail went up went down alongside of him he disappeared and 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 was gone i continued on sort of in dream time and and got to him or got to the spot where he disappeared he wasn't there I looked around frantically and he popped up next to me clawing and spitting and carrying on and screaming then a number of octaves above what one would think humanly possible and somehow I got around him and under him and got him on his back and and uh, and took off with him the shark didn't hit him again I I expected a great lunge uh, to come usually they go back and and seem to attack the same victim again and again we got to the boat uh, a frantic scene there lifted him out of the water blood pouring all over in fact all over me and uh, got him on deck applied a tourniquet uh, a helicopter took him out and uh, two years and and uh, 450 stitches later he was walking again in recent years more than 45 west coast swimmers divers and surfers have been attacked by white sharks most are now limping and scarred Six victims were not as fortunate. They died. The most recent death occurred in Monterey at Christmas, 1981. Lewis Bourne's body was found in this rocky cove six days to the hour from the time he was last seen surfing nearby. State forest ranger Dusty Layton discovered the body waded into the surf to retrieve it. We've been out here looking for any evidence since the day it happened. Within an hour after Lou Boron's body was discovered, biologists and other investigators converged to make their studies. Deceased remains has a large laceration with part of the trunk missing from the left uh, 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 hip area extending up to uh, the left armpit area. That shark attack was a terrifying experience for all the surfers of California. I have the board that that surfer was upon when he was attacked by a white shark. You can see the large bite that was taken by the shark that also probably instantly killed the surfer. This large frozen individual was captured near San Francisco and allows us an opportunity to estimate the distance between the puncture wounds, compare it to the same teeth on this shark. The results, the attacking shark was considerably larger than this 16 foot, 2,200 pound shark. If the largest white shark ever captured was five foot longer and weighed 7,300 pounds, as awesome as that is, I'm told that there are even larger sharks in the ocean, yet no one has ever captured them.
Here we are in the friendlier environment of the aquarium's marine mammal tank. The California waters have not been that friendly to surfers within the last decade. There have been more than 13 attacks by great white sharks upon surfers, often with fatal results. It appears that surfing, although an old sport, is now placing man in a very precarious position. The development of short surfboards, the modern short maneuverable boards, makes us appear like white shark food. Now, imagine, if you will, what a shark sees when a surfer is lying sideways on the board with his hands and legs along the sides. The attack usually comes from behind and beneath. Of course, the silhouette of this surfer looks very much like the white shark's favorite food, the elephant seal. There are more than 350 kinds of living sharks, yet in the public's mind there is only one, the super predator, the great white. This creature is larger at birth than the average of all other living adult sharks. Its growth, although poorly understood, appears to be a massive addition of girth with length such that a large adult might weigh 50 times as much as a yearling. This five-foot individual is a newborn, probably no more than three months old. Yet at three months, the great white shark is able to eat most anything in the ocean. It has a combination of body parts from tail to nose that allow it to swim at high velocity, capture most any struggling prey. This tuna-like tail is different than most other shark tails. It's nearly symmetrical, and one thrust of that powerful tail can make the shark accelerate at 25 miles an hour. It has a cut water at the base of its tail, allowing it to cut its tail back and forth through the water. And the stiff dorsal fin, often seen cutting the water in Hollywood films, is important to keep the shark from rolling. The five slits along the head are the gill slits. Most people think that all sharks must swim in order to breathe. This is true for the white shark, but not true for many other sharks. They can sit quietly on the bottom, using muscular energy to pump water across their gills. The white shark, however, swims through the water with its mouth open, allowing oxygen-rich water to pass along its gill filaments. Through this ramjet ventilation system, the white shark can effortlessly breathe without expending the energy necessary to pump water across its gills. When we were students in school, we read that all fishes are cold-blooded and all mammals are warm-blooded. Well, more recently, we've learned that many mammals can hibernate or become cold-blooded at night. And in like manner, we've learned that four living fishes are warm-blooded, and the great white shark is one of these. You see, it captures the heat generated by its swimming musculature, and through a network of microscopic arteries and veins, it transfers heat through a heat exchanger to the core of its body making its body core as much as five degrees warmer than the water it is swimming through, and making its muscles several times as strong and much more efficient. It's very important to a white shark, which must chase a warm-blooded seal or sea lion through the upper layers that are warm and down to the cold layers of the deeper ocean. The sensory pores located on the top of the head primarily along the snout and lower jaw, are called the ampullae of Lorenzini. These electromagnetic detectors are capable, theoretically, of sensing the pulsing heart of another animal a thousand miles away. Yet in the ocean, with all of the background electrical signals and noise, the shark uses this sense to feel the struggling pulses of its prey item at the surface as the shark attacks. And in that white, bloody froth, the shark, using a sonar-like sense, is capable of recognizing the position of its prey when it can't even see it. Now, in the film Jaws, we saw the great white shark attacking boats. Well, truth is stranger than fiction, because the great white shark very often does attack boats. Not because it likes to eat boats, but because it confuses the electromagnetic cues that the corroding undersurface of a boat produces.
large black sinister eye of the great white shark is adapted to low light level vision. It wasn't until this year that scientists realized that it possesses both rods and cones within the retina for both black and white in color vision. But at the moment of strike, the shark doesn't see its prey. It rolls its eyes tailward in order to protect its eyes from the struggling nails and teeth of the seal upon which it feeds. The white viscous flesh protects the eye and the shark senses its prey with the electromagnetic receivers on the forehead and on the snout. This combination of characters from the tuna-like tail, torpedo-shaped body, stiff fins and sensory receivers allows the white shark to capture most any prey animal in its way. And at that final moment of strike, its ability to thrust its upper jaw forward and outward allows it to grasp the escaping seal or sea lion. It is not surprising that Peter Benchley entitled his book and film Jaws because it is the jaws of the great white shark and its teeth that mankind fears most. Now these jaws from a 2,000 pound, 15 and a half foot shark are quite formidable. But imagine, if you will, what each single tooth is capable of doing. The white shark's tooth is uniquely shaped. It is triangular, sharp, and serrated. This tooth allows it to gouge huge bites out of its normal prey items, cutting through the thick flesh and skin of the seals upon which it feeds. The white shark's tooth is considerably different than other kinds of sharks. For example, the tiger shark, which has a sharp but very asymmetric tooth shape, allowing it to cut through the skin of sea turtles. An incredible mechanism in shark evolution allows the white shark to always have a sharp fresh tooth when it comes to feed upon its prey items. The shark, in fact, intends to lose a tooth after it bites. This nine-foot specimen shows you a sequential row of teeth, like a dental conveyor belt, which allows the tooth to be wiggled free from the jaws of the shark and replaced by a new sharp and fresh tooth after every meal. This tooth came from a 3,000 pound, 16 and a half foot great white shark. Imagine, if you will, the shark that possessed this tooth. It was Megalodon, thought to be extinct several million years ago. Because sharks lack bones, the only knowledge we have of fossil sharks is based upon the teeth. Now, a reconstruction of the jaws based only on this teeth would suggest that the shark was 50 to 90 feet long. A man could walk upright through its open mouth. Peter Benchley realized this when he wrote Jaws and suggested that perhaps Megalodon still lives. Here, in Hollywood's Universal Studios, Megalodon has made a comeback. A motorized, larger-than-life shark performs daily for hordes of open-mouthed tourists. The monster myth is thereby rigorously reinforced, and revenues continue to roll in.
Hollywood gone too far this time? Where does fact end and fantasy begin? Every single instance in the book and almost every instance in the film that involved the shark has happened in one way or another in at one time or another somewhere in the world. I compressed them all into the book and Spielberg and I compressed them into the movie. There are a couple of things that never happened uh, that were, I think, valid cinematic license. Although trained as a scientific skeptic, I now agree with Benchley that truth, when dealing with white sharks, often challenges the imagination. At Dangerous Reef, South Australia, I was given an experience that far exceeded anything that Hollywood could create. I was there with a group of colleagues to film and study the real great white. first reaction as I grappled with that moving cage, held onto the wires, and saw the shark coming at me, about to grab the cage, and what an abject fear and terror and fascination as well. It gave me an opportunity to finally see this animal I had read so much about. And I must say, it's hard to put in words the feeling one has when one is in the water so small and that shark is so large. The opportunity to see it in its own environment taught me things that I could never have learned otherwise. I could really imagine what its prey must have felt, because I was its prey at that time. As a marine biologist, I suggest there's a certain irony, because I felt that I had entered the shark's aquarium, and it was looking at me. It is designed as the super predator. Its beautiful shape and its incredible strength and feeding apparatus make it the most fearsome animal in the ocean. I can only marvel at his strength, beauty, and grace. And at the same time, I'm terrified about its ability to eat me in a single bite. Underwater, I am reminded of the many questions which remain unanswered. We know that they prefer the cool, coastal, oceanic waters, such as off Northern California, New England, Southern Australia, the coast of South America, and the Cape region of South Africa. A century ago, they were occasionally found in the Mediterranean and off the British Isles. Now they are nearly extinct there. Worldwide, they probably number only tens of thousands, well below their previous abundance, when prey was plentiful. Yet what are their movements? Where do they breed? How do they breed? And will they survive? To find answers to these difficult questions, my colleagues and I conducted experiments with the living animals. I study the great white shark because it remains a fascinating enigma to me. This huge fish that's been swimming through the oceans for hundreds of millions of years is still relatively unexplained. We know so little about its behavior. We certainly know more about salmon and goldfish than we do about the great white shark. But I suspect that's because of the difficulty in studying it. Until we can look at a great white shark alive firsthand on a 24-hour basis, we'll really know very little about its whims, its behaviors, and its interests. In San Francisco, I spend as much time as possible away from the confines of my office, chumming, attracting, looking, and trying to capture a live white ship to return it to the aquarium to allow proper and controlled scientific studies, as well as an opportunity to let the public see their real jaws. Causes a little blood to squirt out of the can, it'll appear as if we're an injured animal. I had one incredible opportunity in 1980 when a fisherman called me and told me he had a live great white shark. He named her Sandy. She was seven and a half feet long and 350 pounds and caught in his net. 
He was a very wise fisherman and kept it alive long enough for us to drive to it, obtain her, put her in our truck and drive her back to the aquarium. Well, of course, after all we'd been through, after all these years, the last thing I was going to do was risk the shark's life by watching it swim on its own. I had to be in there with it in case it needed help. Looking back at it, it was pretty foolish because no one had ever done this before. And I guess in a calm moment, if asked, would I jump in the water with a great white shark, I'd say, of course not. That would be nuts. That would be crazy. I was in a circular aquarium, and the shark was swimming around the circle soon to catch up with me. I lay on the bottom as flat as I could, and the shark swam right over my head. At first, we were very nervous about being in the tank with her when the light level was low. But we felt so confident after swimming all day with her that she wouldn't attack us, and she didn't attack us. As the shark became healthier and healthier, it began to show some very aberrant behavior. The first thing we noted was the difficulty that it had with a small portion of the aquarium. It's circular in shape, but there was a five degree arc that we later measured. It was difficult for the shark to swim by. She would swim towards it, sometimes do a 180 degree turn, sometimes collide rather strongly with that smooth portion of the wall. The second day she swam faster, collided more often. And by the third day, we tried to feed her. We put blood in the water. We added a variety of food items to the water, hoping that the other fishes would feed in the tank and that she would get the message from them. But she didn't feed. She was confused. Something relating to her feeding behavior was apparently linked to her collisions with a wall. Finally, we excluded all the possibilities. That was light levels, vibrations, sound, and we're left with electricity. We brought in an electronics engineer. The concrete tank with stainless steel window frames apparently was corroding. There was a weak electrolysis phenomenon going on that within that five degree arc made an electric hotspot. And this electric hotspot, as weak as it was, was very attractive to the shark. We asked the electrician, what could we do to ground it to stop this electrical phenomenon? He said nothing. You must let the water out of the tank and repair it. Well, that leak was obviously responsible for its collisions and most probably responsible for its inability to feed. We thought about it and said, there's nothing we can do in terms of the long-term captivity of the shark. We can't fix the tank. We can't keep the shark anywhere else. We have no choice other than to let it go or to die in the aquarium. The response in San Francisco was immediate and phenomenal. People said, Keep it alive. Do everything you can. Keep that shark alive. And as the shark got weaker after colliding with the tank, people said, let it go. People even came to us and said, we know it's a killer, but let it go. Let it live. We did that. We put her on a boat and took her to the Farallon Islands. With tears in her eyes, we sadly put her in the water and said goodbye to her. She swam away. And we all hoped that someday she would return and be back in the Steinhardt Aquarium. Given what we know, where then do we go from here? If things continue, we can presume that marine mammal populations will increase. If so, then white shark populations will increase. Therefore, it is inevitable that attacks on humans will increase. But then are our alternatives? Well, we could stay out of the water, but that's ridiculous. We could attempt to kill the great white sharks. Well, that's also ridiculous and dangerous because ecological havoc would occur if we were to eliminate the last predator upon the marine mammals. We might also want to reconsider our conservation policies. It is patently naive to presume that we can protect a single species within an ecosystem without affecting the welfare of the other members of that system. One thing is certain, if we do nothing, then attacks upon humans by great white sharks will increase.